Welcome to my podcast, Today's Dream, Tomorrow's Reality. My name is Vicki Poole. I'm a master transformational coach and hypnotist specializing in habit change. This podcast is sponsored by The Enlightened Peach, and it's all about embracing our mosaic life. And some of you may ask, what is a mosaic life? Well, what it is, is it is recognizing that all of the pieces of our life, the good, the bad, the indifferent, have all come together to make us who we are. Change any one thing and we are different. With that in mind, I invite you to embrace your perceived imperfections and celebrate who you are. This podcast is unedited and raw, just like life. And I am your host, and I have a special guest with me today that I will introduce in just a moment. But I would love to have you to ask you to leave a comment on this episode, because the way that we get more viewers for each and every person that comes on here is by having people comment, like, subscribe and share. So do me a solid. Make a comment. Remember to like, subscribe and share. All right. So now let's get started. So this beautiful lady right here, and um, there are people that are listening and not watching, and just trust me, she's a beautiful lady, (laughs) Michelle Steiner, and um, we don't really know each other. We've just were in a group and, you know, and connected just a little bit, and it was like, ah, you know, I really, I would really love to have her story to tell, and um, she's a disability writer, and I'm going to let her do a little introduction of herself, and then we're just going to have a chat and get to know each other. So you're here for the fun. All right. So Michelle, just go ahead and tell a a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you so much for having me, Vicki. My name is Michelle Steiner. I live in Pennsylvania with my husband, Ron, and our two cats, Jack and Sparrow. I am a disability writer, speaker, and photographer, and I'm also a paraeducator. I work in a school with students who have disabilities and some who don't. And I also have a blog called Michelle's Mission, where I write about life with a learning disability and feature my photography that I take on my many walks on my store. Ah, that sounds fabulous. So just, I don't, I don't know what's politically correct and what is not, you know, but what is your disability? My disabilities are dyscalculia, a math learning disability, uh, limited hand dexterity in both of my hands, Mm -hmm. and visual perception issues that affects my brain, not my eyes. Okay, well, I don't understand that. So you tell me what that means. (laughs) Sure. Um, Dyscalculia, which is a math disability, is... uh, I have trouble with how numbers work. It can be really difficult for me to remember the steps of a math problem. Mm -hmm. I don't see numbers backwards, but I really have a hard time with just how they work. I'm not able to read the face of an analog clock, which I can see the, yeah, I can see the numbers. I can see the uh, little dashes that are, the little marks that are on there. And I can tell you it's a circle, but I just, I'm not able to understand that. I also have trouble with, uh, I confuse my left with my right and directional concepts don't make any sense. I cannot give directions and it can be really hard when people give directions to me. And the visual perception, that affects my eye-hand coordination. So I can trip over air really easily. (laughs) And I really... I can do that and I don't have a disability. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And we knew that, you know, driving is impossible for me with that um, because of my reaction time Mm -hmm. and and things like that. And I can remember gym class with whenever the ball would come at me, I would flinch and I had a hard time uh, coordinating my body. Mm-hmm. I love to do non-competitive fitness, but doing those team sports, it's, it's really hard for me. And I have limited hand dexterity in both of my hands. And that wasn't diagnosed until I was an adult. Wow. And all, all of a sudden, once that diagnosis came, I was like, oh, this is why things fall out of my hands. We just assumed I had bad handwriting because I was um, real, I had a learning disability. And then we, it made a lot of sense why things would fall out and why it was hard for me to use my fine motor skills with uh, opening up jars and containers and unlocking doors. That was, that was a real difficulty for me. So just so I understand, because 
This is mm -hmm. a new one for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm probably it is for a lot of our listeners too. Mm -hmm. um, but does that mean you don't have the strength in your hand to do things or that you just, you can't make your fingers do what you want it to? It's both? a little bit of both. I mean, there there is the both like the strength, but it's also, I just can't coordinate my fingers. Like if I go over a, a jar, uh, it can be really hard for me to open or I can just, I can hold a key in my hand but when I had to unlock the door, it's just trying to coordinate that and to be able to have that moving is really difficult. In fact, whenever they tested me, they had me put shapes in a shape sorter and I was blindfolded. And I always think it's hilarious because I it's an eight hour evaluation for the total thing with having a, a learning disability. And I had to call in food, my lunch and the delivery driver comes in and there I am blindfolded, putting in shapes in a shape sorter. So I always think that's just <laughs> You probably, thing. you were the talk of the town that day, you know? Yeah, like, what are they doing there? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Well, let's go back a little bit from when you were younger. And how old were, were you when they um, found out that you had the learning disability? So I would imagine was it school age with the math thing yes. or no? Yeah. I yes, I was in kindergarten. I had to be about five or maybe six years old at the mm -hmm. oldest. And my kindergarten teacher saw that I was really struggling with a lot of math and visual perception. I couldn't tie my shoes. I had trouble counting. And I also had social skills issues. But a lot of that was um also do because I was an only child for 13 years. So I didn't have a whole lot of people to uh, relate to that were my age. Right. And I can remember my teacher uh, recommended to my parents that I get tested for having one. And sure enough, they found out that I, I do have one. They didn't give a specific diagnosis at that point. Uh, we were very familiar with dyslexia. We were very familiar with things such as that, but they didn't, um, have dyscalculia that, uh, or the, the term for that, I, I never heard whenever I was a child growing up. And the only thing they knew at that age was I was never going to be a mathematician. We, we <laughs> determined that whenever I was five or six. <laughs> and that was a little hard for my dad to understand because he's good with numbers and thinking, oh, wow. well, he wanted you to follow in his footsteps, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but that that's how it was. And I had to repeat kindergarten. And I went to another school in our district, still a private school within our school district. I mean, a public school, excuse me. But I had to, I began to receive specialty services and had to repeat kindergarten the following year. And it was really difficult during that time because I can just remember, even as a young child, I was really discouraged and I just thought, oh, having this disability, not, no good's ever going to come out of it. And it's just going to hold me back for the rest of my life. And I obviously can't learn. And it turns out that uh, things do get better. And I was able to learn. It just, in the beginning, it was really hard. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as a, as a young child, we want to be like everybody else. We do mm -hmm. not want to be, you know, unique. And um, so it's got to be really hard. So is there anything, when you think back to those days, is there anything that stands out to you that, um, might have been extra painful that might help someone else that may be listening or is struggling with some of the th same things that let them know that, you know, that happens to other people and maybe what you did to help yourself with that situation. Right. I think one of the first messages I love to tell people is things get better. I think that's the main message because mm -hmm. when I was young, I couldn't see the future. I couldn't see uh, how everything in my life was going to turn out. And I thought it wasn't going to turn out good, but it did. And I can also remember I really struggled uh, with bullying because okay. when I was a young child, that started very early. I went to a very small conservative school district. I couldn't blend in even when I was in regular ed classes. I, people could see that I went to learning support. So that was really mm. difficult for me. And the bullying really started as a young child and it got worse as I was a teenager. I can remember just not feeling like I fit in with any group because a lot of the friend groups become more defined. And what helped me yeah. was I found an art group that was outside of my school district with kids my own age. And I started hanging out with them and I got involved with their newsletter 
and I could shed that reputation that that followed me since I was a very young child as being the outcast or the, the girl with a disability. And I, even when I came out and said, hey, I have a disability, I found a lot of other people that had that as well. And when that group stopped meeting, I also found an adult writing group in my late mm. teen years. And my friends, they took me under their wing and we they got to watch me grow as a writer and as a person 20 some years later we still meet oh, today amazing and yeah you know, we're still in each other's lives and and they encouraged me to write about having a disability and at that very young age i thought oh no that's not something <laughs> i want to do it's too personal wrote some really bad poetry and some other things that <laughs> I, I would not want to read today but when I finally took their advice years later, that was something that really helped uh, me and some other people as well. And I think also something that advice I'd love to give is not to have other people limit you. I mm -hmm. can remember when I was in school, I knew I wanted to go to college and I had teachers who told me that I couldn't do it because I had a learning disability and they encouraged a vo vocational training school. And there's nothing wrong with going to a technical school. They have a lot of great programs if you have something you're interested in. And there was nothing that interested me. And I got involved with an agency called Office for Vocational Rehabilitation. And they were going to, they paid for college, they paid for all their testing. But as I was an adult, I still got more uh, stigma that surrounded me. Mm -hmm. I've never been a yeah, never been a great test taker. When I took the test for, with OVR, uh, the psychiatrist that evaluated me said, you're most likely not going to go beyond a community college. <laughs> and later on, they told me that I would most li I could not have the job that I wanted with writing, news reports, at, or things like that. That would be on uh, my capabilities. When I went to campus, I had more discrimination. I had people that saw using disability services as cheating or an unfair advantage. And mm. I had an advisor that told me that I was going to have limited job choices. And I was really negative throughout a lot of those years. I just wanted to be like everybody else. And I used eventually I had a professor that said, why don't we at least get you extended test time? I was able to pass her class. And I graduated with an associate's degree in early childhood education, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted more for myself. And when I had to move back in with my parents for financial reasons, that is when I thought, I'm going to give university a try. And sure enough, I found a program that interested me and had the least amount of math and science possible. <laughs> and I graduated with a bachelor's degree despite being told I couldn't do it. Wow, that's amazing. And you know, this is something that I talk about with some of my clients and in a group that I have on mm -hmm. Facebook. And it's like, we, unfortunately, you know, it's like we, mm -hmm. people treat us in certain ways, and it changes the way we view the world, mm -hmm. you know, so it's almost like they, they end up tinting our glasses in a negative right. way. So that when we're looking out, we it's harder for us to see the possibilities. And um, and, you know, even even people without disabilities, sometimes mm -hmm. they can just be held back so bad. And I just cannot even imagine, you know, if you've got a disability and everybody's telling you this stuff. Yeah, it's got to be mm -hmm. a really hard bridge to cross over and and get through. So kudos to you, because it shows mm -hmm. what an amazing spirit you have, because that's what happens to a lot of people that are challenged in this way is that they start listening to everybody and they mm -hmm. give up. And yep. a lot of times the people around them are more than happy to help them give up because they don't think they can do anything anyway. So you're in a great, an amazing inspiration. And I hope everybody that's yeah. watching or listening, if you know anyone who has ever struggled with even just mm -hmm. trying to fit in, whether it's a handicap or not. But if they, especially if they've got a, mm -hmm. a disability, then definitely share this with them so that they can see there is a light at the end of the tunnel kind of thing, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. definitely. Yeah, so I'm so impressed with you. That is amazing. 
Thank you. Yeah, because now you're a writer. So you have books or newsletters. What do you have? I um, have a blog called Michelle's Mission, where I write mm -hmm. about life with a learning disability. And I also have this, I have also had articles that have been published. I can remember my first article was about my struggle with opening up locks with limited hand dexterity. And that was okay. on the mighty. And I, that encouraged me to write more. And I also last summer had three stories published in an anthology that's available on Amazon called rediscovering your story. And I went oh, to wow. different workshops where we had prompts about different things. So some of mm -hmm. them were fun ones about our hair and other ones were about what is the most, our favorite place. And we also had one about writing, what is the most important lesson you've ever learned in your life? And it was just a really great workshop and got some stories published on that as well. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Um, so just so everybody will know, mm -hmm. um, when I get this posted out that mm -hmm. in our description, I will have all of the links to everything about you so they can, they can check out your blog. Okay. Um, they can find your book. They can connect with you however you want them to connect. So make sure when you're watching or listening that you go to the description and you see exactly how to reach out to Michelle, because um, she's definitely going to be worth reaching out to, I, I believe. Um, have you ever thought of, and you may or may not have, but a lot of people that have written blogs and mm -hmm. newsletters and things like that, that they have those amazing things translated into a book. Have you ever thought of that? I would love to do that eventually. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> because I know um, there's a, a person that I know in one of the groups that I'm in. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that she does is she helps oh. people to take their their material and convert it into a book so that you're not sitting and having to think, oh, gosh, what am I supposed to say? You know, <laughs> right, right. Oh, awesome. it can be quite daunting. But, you know, to take your mm -hmm. material that you've already got and create a book out of it so everybody can just read it all the way through. That would be amazing. I would I would get that book. <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you're a para educator. So yes. what is it that you do with that? I work to help students in the classroom and the teacher. So sometimes I will take a student and I get that opportunity to read a test to them and okay. I get to help them with their work. And I work alongside with the teacher on whatever their, their needs are. And I also show them how to advocate for themselves too. Because a lot of times it's like listening to a recording of myself in sixth grade. I hate having my learning disability. I think I'm not, not very smart. And I get to be that voice that tells them, you are very smart. Your brain's just wired differently. And I get to uh, help them out. With yeah, that. perfect. Well, I'm sure you're a blessing to them. Um, so how long have you been doing that? I have been doing, uh, I've been at my current job for 13 years. Oh. Wow, you must be really good at it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so do you have favorite students? Yes, I, there are students that I can definitely say are my favorites. And yes, definitely. They, they, they always make me smile when I come into the room. And I, I just love working with them. Yeah, well, you know, I used to have a client that she was a teacher for, mm -hmm. um, it was physical disability children. Mm -hmm. And um, she had been doing it for just a little bit longer than you, but not a lot. But she mm -hmm. said one of her greatest joys was when they would, because it was an elementary school that she worked with. She said when they would come back to visit her and she would see the growth that they had had and they mm -hmm. would say, oh, I just loved you so much and I miss you. And she said that people were still like she would even stay in contact with their parents and they'd write her letters and so do you mm -hmm. find that you have, you've been there long enough. Do you have people that come back in and visit? What grade is it that you're working with, by the way? Graders uh, right now, sixth graders, sixth middle graders? school okay. age. I've worked in the high school system all the way to a, a kindergarten classroom. And I've had students that have, we have staff shout out. And I have had a, a student that has um, definitely wrote some really nice things about me. I've had students that just simply thank me. And I, I have run into parents of say, you were my child's favorite teacher or my child really liked working with you. And, and that always just makes my day when I feel that I, I made a difference in, in the life of somebody. 
Yeah, well, I can say that even if they don't speak out, you know you did. And so um, I think a lot of times everybody, when we're helping people, we mm -hmm. always, if they're not telling us, we don't really realize how much we've done. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's a good reminder to say, you know, you've made a difference. And so, yeah. so be happy and smile about that and just take it in your heart. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what's your favorite thing about um, being able to do all this? Cause you come from a place of, um, you know, I, I hate this. I don't want to be like this. And then now you've come to this place that you love who you are. I can tell by the smile on your face <laughs> and you're working with other children to help them not to have the, 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 the hard time that you did in the same way, especially. Mm -hmm. And so what is your favorite thing about what you get to do now? My favorite thing is having that connection with somebody and getting to pay it forward. I just love being able to go into the classroom and encouraging somebody. And all the kids know, do not ask me to help you with math, but I can help out with other things. <laughs> and the conversations and that way that I can just make that difference in, in their lives. Because mm -hmm. somebody did read a test to me and somebody did do their best to help me. I didn't have disability representation though. So I didn't know somebody that had a disability or I didn't have a lot of advice that, that came right from a person that experienced that. Right. So I think that, I think it's just all the connections I, I get to make and uh, help other people out. Yeah. And it's so like when you're a kid going through things, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times you look at people as, well, you don't know what you're talking about because yeah. you've never <laughs> experienced this before. So you kind of eliminated that, especially to where, you can say, yes, I have been where you are, yeah. I have been you, right? <laughs> I know. I've had students that might have been in some situations and they, I'll talk to them and they'll say, well, you don't know what it's like. It seems like you have a perfect life. And I get to tell them, no, I, I don't have a perfect life. And sometimes I get to share a lot of my experiences too. And and that is just sometimes that, that helps another person be able to understand that, We've all been there. We, we've all, whether we have a disability or we don't, all of us ha have been in sixth grade before. And mm -hmm. we really get that. And I just have that experience of being someone that has a disability. And sometimes I can connect with that. And I think that I got, I got to really see that a couple of years ago when I was working with a ninth grader. Mm -hmm. And I had a kid in the class that said, oh, you help me with my math. And of course, I can't do that. And, and the one child looked at me and said, uh, oh, why can't you do it? And I said, oh, God, just didn't give me that ability. And there was a little girl in the class that said, me too. Aww. And I think sometimes that humility and being really honest helps other people to show, especially kids, that everybody struggles with something. Yeah, And yeah. I've even had a really another really funny one was I was trying to help out in a first grade classroom and they were doing math. And I can remember I got the problem wrong. No surprise <laughs> for me, but I a little girl couldn't understand that. And she said, oh, why do, why do you why can't you do it? And I said, oh, I just really struggle with numbers. And she said, well, there's grown up school for that. <laughs> And I just had to laugh. <laughs> That's too funny. <laughs> so when you're thinking about, and, and I know you probably don't want to go there, but if you would mm -hmm. for us, if you think back about the things that you dealt with as a young mm -hmm. child growing up, and if there's one thing that stands out, because, you know, like you just said, that being vulnerable is an amazing thing and it helps people to see, you know, mm -hmm. these are things that we deal with. And, you know, if if you can maybe just pick one and just kind of give us a little bit of a what happened and what you were feeling in that moment and how afterwards you know, as a kid, sometimes it takes a while to kind of analyze it and make it feel, you know, not so bad. But is there something that you can share that would kind of help the people that might be dealing with something like this? 
I can't remember when I was a really young child, one of the things I struggled with was handwriting. That was always the big thing that I, I struggled with from uh, the, the start. And I can remember I had a teacher who put W on my report card that indicated weakness. Mm -hmm. And I felt really bad whenever I read that. And I can remember a lot of teachers made a big deal about uh, my handwriting. And somebody told me that, uh, oh, if you want to be a writer, you're going to have to be neat. And mm. I think some of the greatest joy is that with technology that came out is when I learned how to type. And I could express how I was feeling. So you and, can do the typing well, just not yeah. the holding the pencil, right? Right, exactly, okay. or holding the pencil. I mean, I still do make mistakes, but thank goodness for grammar check and yeah. <laughs> spelling and all, spell check and all of that. I know I'm but, glad it underlines it, you know, because it's like, Yes, what? and then you can see it. Oh, okay, yeah, that's what, I, and it took me an extra semester to be able to learn how to type. Most students go in with the first semester or the first couple weeks and they, they know what they're doing. But it took me a whole year. So, but it was all worth it in the end. And when I look back on the people that uh, said my writing was more of a character flaw, or I look back at the kid that told me all those years ago, oh, if you want to be a writer, you have to be neat. To this day, I have not had an editor that said, hey, I want a handwritten draft of everything <laughs> that you wrote. Everything now <laughs> is digital. And, and yeah. I just think that things get better. And I just always emphasize that because I think whenever you're young and you can't see ahead into the future, it's always, well, I'm never going to be able to do this because this is uh, what I have. And also that it's so much more empowering for me to focus on what I can do rather than what I can't. Because I can remember we would have motivational speakers that would come in and they would talk, you can do anything you put your mind to. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to master math. And I couldn't do it. And I would be really disappointed. Long time to realize that I can do things. I just have to find for the things. There's some things I simply can't. And for those things, I just have to find a way around them. And I can still mm -hmm. have success in my life. And when I start focusing on what I can do, it just turns into a better experience than when I focus on what I can't. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. You're talking about them uh, mm -hmm. saying that you have to write neat. I was teaching a <laughs> workshop one time for adults and mm -hmm. the, you were supposed to sign in and put your email and everything. Well, when I <laughs> oh, got yeah. home and I looked, I couldn't read half of the emails. It was yeah. like, it was like a foreign language or something. The, the way they wrote their letters wasn't correct. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I can't get this. So from that point on, it was like, it, it was a digital thing. You know, yeah. here's my iPad, sign up here so that I knew I could read the typing, you know? <laughs> and I had the same issue a couple years ago when I had CPR cards and we had to put our email on there to get our cards. And I put the, the they put the wrong name in because they couldn't read it. And it took, I, I had to sign in on a different name and I'm like, all right, at least we know we have the cards, but that, that is a better option because then you're not stuck trying to figure out, oh, whose name is this? Yeah. Yeah. It can be Me very know. daunting yeah. to try to figure it out. And then you yeah. feel bad because the people are waiting for you to be corresponding with them and yep. I can't do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I hear yeah. you on that. <laughs> yeah. So technology has definitely been a blessing in so many ways, so many ways, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, but you know, it's like now you can do digital journals and so mm -hmm. and like right now, I'm in the process of just in the beginning process of writing a book. And um, um I'm not writing it out because then I'll be double duty by half because if I write right. it out, then I have to go and put it on my laptop too. So I'm just typing it out on my laptop. And um, but it's a it's a slow process, but it's mm -hmm. it's fun. I'm enjoying it. So I'm so glad that you find ways to do things. And and I'll share now. My my niece doesn't have a learning disability, she has a physical mm -hmm. disability. Okay. Um, she has muscular dystrophy, mm -hmm. and but she figures out how to hold things or do things so she can paint yeah. and things like mm -hmm. that. And it's like other people have the ability to just pick up their arms and, and do it. Right. But mm -hmm. she has to figure exactly how she can strategically move around how she, where she needs to press on things. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm always amazed with anybody with any kind of disability because they always figure out how to make what they have work for them. Yep. You know, exactly. Yeah. So it's yeah, beautiful. It, thank you. Yeah. And you know, when you say that people will say you can do anything you want to, um, I think 
that is true to a certain extent, but there are yeah. limits. It's like if yeah. you woke up and you, if you were born blind, you can think you're going to see all the time, but it's not going to change what's attached to your retina kind of thing. So yeah, exactly. there are certain things that are beyond our capabilities. So I think when people say that to me, I think to me, they're telling me that the things that I'm capable of doing, I can exceed at it if I choose to. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh, I agree. Yeah. The things that yeah. you can, yeah, exactly. I, yeah. I agree with you hundred percent. Yeah. An ex analogy I like to use with that is you wouldn't ask a person that's in a wheelchair to go up the steps, but if you provide a ramp or you provide an elevator, everybody goes to the same place. So the person can get to that place Right. They just can't use the steps to get there. Yeah, that's true. So they can do the thing. They just can't mm -hmm. get it in the same way. Yeah. I love exactly. that analogy. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. <laughs> so um, you have two cats. Yes. Right. How yes, old are I your do. cats? Uh, I believe that Jack is four and I think Sparrow is like six. We got that. We adopted them. Mm -hmm. They uh, we adopted them off a family a couple years ago uh, that was moving out of state and they could take their dog with them, but they couldn't take the cats and they wanted them to be together. And our other cat passed away. Chi passed away a couple months ago from congestive heart failure. So we took them in and not exactly sure the, the, the exact age of them, but they've just okay. become more, part of our family for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. I have cats myself and one Aww. of them is sleeping right here beside me. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier I was on a call and um, she was going over there and she was jumping up on a shelf. And so she was very active, but I think she's yes. tired now. She's She got wore out. Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, Jack yeah. is the one that'll, I think he wants his own talk show. He, I have to keep <laughs> him upstairs because otherwise he will come down and he'll decide that he wants to go across the keyboard and wants to come and uh, meow and mm -hmm. <laughs> give his now, opinion. It's funny because I was recording a podcast just the other day. <laughs> And um, I forgot what her cat's name was, but uh -huh. I couldn't see the cat, but I could hear it uh -huh. all the way the, you know, half the time she said, that's what he does. As soon as I get on here, he starts talking. <laughs> they, they do that. Yeah. And I can remember I did a, a podcast with somebody. It was her very first podcast and both of the cats got into a cat fight <laughs> right in the middle of the show. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. This is your first <laughs> this is your first one. And here I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting how podcasts work because I, yeah. I love it because it's, you know, it's free flowing and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I had one um, lady that was um, a guest on my podcast and her, she had ch several children and her mm -hmm. oldest child was watching the younger ones. And all of a sudden <laughs> you could hear one, the, the baby outside the door crying and hitting on the door, mama, mama, mama. And she said, he'll come get him in a minute. And I said, you know, you can stop and just go take care yeah, of him. Exactly. We'll be here. We'll be waiting on you. So that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> Things, life happens. You just that's have to kind of go with what, what you get. <laughs> yeah. That's why I love um, doing this in this way is that there's no stress or expectations mm -hmm. on how things go. It's just, yes. just let it go. Yeah. Yeah. So it's been super exciting having you on here. And I kind of feel like um, I'd like for you to maybe share, you know, what what do you share in your, um, you said it's not a blog. What is it? Or is it a oh, blog? I have a blog and an oh, online a, store. Yeah. Okay. A blog. What do you have on the online store? I have um, some of my photography because I'm not able to drive. Oh, okay. I get to capture details that other people will miss. I'll be in the car with my husband. And I'll say, did you see that? And he'll say, no, I did it. And whenever I get a chance to go on a walk, if I don't have a ride somewhere, or if I just simply want to go out and enjoy nature rather than drive, I get a chance to capture some pictures of some beautiful flowers. And I put oh. them on my store. And I write a lot about uh having a learning disability and some of the metaphors with, with flowers. Ooh, do share. Tell us something about that. I write about how my, uh, my journey with a learning disability is like a flower that's blossoming, or I might write about, uh, you know, bloom where you're planted, but don't be afraid to grow. And I can talk about some of a lilac bush that we have and a peonies one that we have that we got on the discount rack and with and 
people were saying, oh, it's not going to thrive. It's not going to bloom. Nothing's really going to happen with it. And sure enough, every year it, we get to see the joy of both of them coming up. And I look at my life with a learning disability as being the one a lot of people would discard. And I got a chance to, they didn't think I was going to have much potential, but like the lilacs and the peonies, I grew and um, been able to have be successful in my life. Amazing. I love that. I love that. So I would love to see some of your artwork. So I'll have to um, check yes. out that link when you give it to me. Um, but I you know, yes. talking about these plants, I, I'll just share a little quick sh uh, story mm -hmm. that I shared with some people the other morning. And because there's always like these little things mm -hmm. that happen that make you think of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And I had been, um, when we moved into our house and we're renting, so I've got a fig tree that's in this big wine barrel. Mm -hmm. um, because when I bought it, I knew I was going to be moving and I wanted to be able to take it with me. Right. Mm -hmm. So we've this, it's been in this barrel for a while and now it's got where it's not growing real well. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it and I said, well, you know, it could have beautiful blooms. It could have beautiful mm -hmm. fruit and all that stuff, but it's been right now it's bound into this one right. space. And if we put it in the ground where it could just spread out and grow, yeah. you know, it would be a monstrous tree, right? But right, right now exactly. it's, it's in this little bitty wine barrel. And so I was talking to some people the other morning and I was saying, you know, where in your life are you being put in a yeah. wine barrel and you're not allowed to grow? And so I love that you have figured out ways to grow regardless of what wine barrel people are trying to put you in. <laughs> Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I can't, I can't always choose. I couldn't choose where I was planted. Um, I couldn't choose have uh, the disability, the seed that that was with me, like a flower, can't, a rose can't change into a lily. But mm -hmm. each of them has beauty, each of them has potential. And it's where they're planted. And even if it's not always the most ideal things, we still have that choice to grow. We still have that choice to be able to bloom. Uh, once we're planted there, it's it's just really up to the, the flower. Yes. Amazing. Oh, that is beautiful. I love it. And I know anybody that's watching or listening, you can probably see where in your life, maybe mm -hmm. you're not appreciating the blooms and the flowers that you're yep. producing. Right. And um, so definitely I will, I will share the links and check out her blog post and her store to see her pictures. And um, so are they like prints that are framed or is it just I, a digital print? What is it? I have a dig uh, they're digital prints mm -hmm. and I also have journals and notebooks available as well too. Ooh, that's now that now you're speaking my language. <laughs> <laughs> I love artwork and I love, love journals. I have a journal for almost every little thing that I'm doing. You know, there's the affirmation mm -hmm. journal. There's the goals journal. There's awesome. my, reading my Bible journal, you know, all those different yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, we're just about out of time. So is there anything in that you would like to say that maybe I haven't asked a question or brought something up that you really want to make sure that you let people know to inspire them or whatever it is, you know, feel free to, to do that. Sure. I would just love to tell people that success doesn't always come in the package that you expect, but sometimes it comes in something even better. Ah, yes. Words to live by. That's for sure. <laughs> that's for sure. And you know, one of the things that I leave people with every single time is the phrase, the best way to predict the future is create it. What are you creating? Like and it fits in there perfectly, <laughs> right? Yes, it does. <laughs> I like that. Yes. All right. So thank you everybody for being here and remember to do me a solid, leave a comment. Um, make sure you check out all of her information in the description and go to her store, look at her blog and make sure also that you like subscribe and share this channel because the only way that I get everybody's story out in the manner that I would love to is if that you help me to get it out. So please do that. And, um, and I will say goodbye and I will see you soon.